here's what I found on the web. Welcome everyone. We're going to be getting started in just a few moments. Um, I think you sh should all have come in as muted. Jasmine, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, in just a couple of minutes, I will do the housekeeping and we will get this started. I just want to give people a moment or two more to sign on. And while we're waiting for everyone to join us, you might want to um, take a second to go to se4nonprofits.com there, and uh, there's a template there that Michael will be talking about during the webinar. Um, Michael, did you want to go back to sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, I just was making sure it was moving. It's okay. You have the screen control now? I do. You need to take it back. Oh, not till you're done. No worries. Okay. All right, we look like we've got a pretty good group here. So let me get us started. Let's do with the housekeeping first. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will share the recording and the slides with everybody. We will also, um, Michael will also be talking about a template um, worksheet on his website at se4nonprofits.com and you may wanna go there and grab it. Um, the webinar will be an hour. We will have 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to go through that uh, worksheet and five minutes at least for Q&A, maybe more. We are going to do Q&A, but we're not going to do it um, in audio because that is, we tend to get people talking over each other. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. We will also be using the chat box for some feedback amongst ourselves, and Michael will ask for it sometimes. But I want to um, keep any questions that we want to try and make sure get answered in the Q&A box itself. And I will be moderating those questions. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Michael, and then I'm going to let him talk a little bit about himself as well. Um, some of you may remember him. He did a presentation for partnership executive directors several years ago, really an, an all day training on financial management, which was very much uh, welcomed and appreciated. He's been a, a, an accountant focusing on nonprofits for many years with a firm here in DC that's extremely well known and respected, Rubino and Co. He also has done trainings for nonprofits for a very long time. And um, what that means is that he has worked with nonprofits during prior recessions, during prior periods when nonprofit funding was threatened and helped keep them strong. And so he's been thinking a lot recently about the best way to help us all survive and thrive. I asked him to do this webinar as the first step in a series of resources that we're gonna to try to provide to you because the partnership's goal here is to keep the partnership network strong and capable of advocating for kids throughout whatever comes over the next year or two. And I think he's really an invaluable resource for you guys um, in that respect. So I do want you to be watching. There will be additional um, activities. I'm not sure exactly what they'll look like, largely because we first need to see what you guys need as a result of this webinar. Michael, before I turn the polls on, do you wanna talk a little bit more about your background for them? Sure. Thank you, Deb. I'm very excited to be here and just um, really have an amazing feeling for Partnerships for America's Children and the, and the different organizations that um, through Deb that I've gotten to meet over the time. Uh, just a quick background. Um, I am a CPA, but I always like to tell people I come from your side of the table. I started out working with nonprofits as an intern. I caught the bug. I've always thought of myself first and foremost as a project manager it comes at it from a financial side. Up until three years ago, I had spent my whole career in public accounting, uh, but on the consulting side, I'm not an auditor or tax preparer and such. 
but I've been there sitting in between, you know, a CFO, chief financial officer, and a CSO, a chief strategy officer, um, helping organizations plan in and around the budgeting process, shortening intermediate planning, governance, sustainability, effective financial messaging are the keys. About three years ago, I uh, pivoted out of nonprofits, thank, um, not nonprofits, out of uh, public accounting, thank God. I uh, had a great um, firm. The firm I was with was for 20 years. I have a great relationship with them. It's just I wanted to be able to move over to a platform where I could just do all consulting at the C-suite and board level. And now I can split my time more evenly between teaching and uh, working with nonprofit organizations and being a volunteer. And I, you know, my wife and I, we like to set aside a significant portion of our time to be able to sit on boards and volunteer and such. Um, so on the teaching side, my home base is I teach at Georgetown University and a number of different um, um, schools there and the McDonough Business School, the McCourt Public Policy School. I do some adjunct in the School of Journalism and such around effective financial communications. I also teach in the ASAE CAE programs. If you've been to any of their conferences, you've probably seen me. I'm usually at the annual meeting and um, associations at work and such. And I am in the IOM, the Institute of Organizational Management, teaching there at five different universities, which people get the IOM designation. And doing a lot of um, work with national organizations like Partnerships for America's Children. You know, I do classes for uh, the National Urban League, Volunteers of America, United Way, different groups uh, like that. So Deb, I just, um, I, I, what I do want to say is, is that what we'll be talking here about today, um, I've been um, doing a lot of presentations and um, the worksheet I am using, I literally, um, the framework we're going to be talking about as we go through, I am using it as groups call in, it's my cheat sheet. I, I even go a little old school on it. I make sure I have 10 copies of it sitting in my backpack at any time so I can pull it out real quick and when someone calls and, and start sketching out. So I'll throw it back to you, Deb. Great. Um, I'm going to put up uh, the first poll in question. And while I do that, I do want to mention to everybody that um, the website that we've steered you to for the template is actually a website that Michael has put up um, and you should all be able to see the poll and answer it now. And if that's not true, let me know. Um, the, the website that we put in the chat box is a website that Michael has done um, in, in, co in partnership with a colleague who focuses on the legal side of nonprofit governance. So it is a resource for you beyond just uh, fiscal and financial issues. And I really encourage you to check it out. It's a new website. They are posting weekly. There's a new blog I understand up right now that is talking about um, when and how it's appropriate to use organizational reserve funds, for example. Um, so please do check it out. I think it's going to be an invaluable resource over the next uh, crisis period to be determined. Um, We've got about half our people have responded so far, Michael. So I'm going to give it another minute or two and then I, or a moment or two, and then I will show the responses that we've got. Okay, good. Um, I can't see the responses, but that's okay. You will when I hit and polling. Just give it a minute. Okay. okay. And if you can't see them at that point, I'll read the answers off. Okay. But we're, we're still getting responses coming in very fast. So I'm going to give it a minute. Okay, it looks like most people have responded. Oh, no, we have a couple more coming in. Okay. Um, all right, looks like we've captured most people. So and end the polling. Can you guys, can you see the answers now, Michael? Uh, no, you know, I've lost, I have audio, but I don't, 
I, and it's okay because the PowerPoint slides are up and running. So okay. if you'll just let me know. <laughs> All right, so here's the responses. Um, about 55%, 56% of the people on this webinar did apply for the Paycheck Protection Loan. Um, in, when we asked, do you anticipate making staffing changes in the next year, 38% um, plan to hire new staff for new projects, 29% are planning to hire staff, people who left, and they can pick more than one here, so those could be the same organizations. 15% are anticipating laying off or furloughing staff. 32% uh, are not replacing people who leave or have left. And the third question is, are you considering making significant changes um, to the structure or budget for your organization for financial reasons? 75% um, right now say no. 6% um, or two organizations are thinking about a merger. Um, no one's looking at shared services. Uh, five of them, or 15%, are looking at reducing staff and cutting budget significantly. And thank goodness, nobody thinks they may have to close. Um, we do have uh, two people who said they were doing something other, and I need to flip over the, the chat to see what that's about. And I, Linda, I can see your hand is up, but if you could put your comment in the chat box, that would be great. Um, so, uh, one organization is restructuring roles. Um, people cannot see the slides right now. I think we're, we're going to switch back to you, Michael, and if that doesn't work, I will share my slides and move them for you. Um, okay. So, someone else is also looking at restructuring the org chart. So, I'm going to, oh, I see, the, wait a minute. My apologies. Can everyone see the results now? I think I didn't click another button. Just so I know, yes, you can see the slides. Okay, so we're gonna stop sharing those results. Michael, can you share your screen or do you need me to put my slides up? Um, I have my slide deck up and ready to go. Can you see it? No, you need to share your screen. Okay, it went off. Um, hold on a sec. Um, Okay, I'm going to go back to share screen, and um, you should be able to see it now. Yes. Now what okay. we see is, um, we don't see it. just the one slide. You need to go into your slide deck, but we yeah, see your screen. I'm doing it now. Good. Okay, everybody good? And yeah. we can see it, and I'm moving. Okay, thank you, Deb. I'll go ahead and get started now. Um, as a... In continuing in the introduction, on the front page, you'll see um, the two websites. I encourage you um, to go to se4nonprofits.com. That's the platform where we're posting information from a fiscal, financial, legal, and governance side. Uh, that led website started uh, only about three, three and a half weeks ago. So everything up there is fresh and new. We're posting. Um, uh, multiple times a week. Um, and as Deb said, we just I just finished an article working with conjunction with Georgetown University on, on using operating reserves. And that is um, that is up now um, for you to take a look. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. A couple of things I do want to share on, on the on the front end. Um, we're in a really unusual hyper change period right now. And um, in, in what I mean by that, I'm gonna go through a few learning objectives, but you're gonna hear me say these three over and over. There's three things up in the air that, that are making this super challenging as with most crises are. It's the timing and pace of change. Still, we're trying to figure that out right now. The scope of the change and the impact of the change. And um, you know, I was like physically impacted by the last two um, crises that we went through, which is both 9-11 in the banking crisis of 2008 and 9, where, um, where there was one uniform thing that we all looked back on and agreed on was that we, we, if we could have done things differently, we probably would have, we didn't anticipate how long those crises were going to be with us and how they were going to impact um, operations. And almost all of us ended up burning through more operating reserves or thought we should have pivoted a little bit faster. 
And we're going to come back to that theme over and over again. And I do constantly remember turning on the TV, especially during the banking crisis, and seeing Warren Buffett on at night saying, I'm not sure when this is going to change, when we're going to pivot, when we're going to start recovery. And I'm sitting here thinking, boy, this is, you know, the smartest financial mind in the country, and he's not sure. So what we're going to do is there's a key premise, and we're going to look at a framework and a communication strategies that will help you during this uncertain time. And the premise is this, that until we um, can see where recovery is starting to come and all that, that we need to run all key decision making through a filter that overly favors, overly weights the decision making's impact on our financial position. Because during this crisis time, until we see where this is going, the biggest risk for nonprofits is financially hurting, you know, putting the organization in a position. So when we come back out of this on the, on the other side, um, you know, some groups will actually disappear. Some groups are going to really struggle. And we're going to take strong groups that are going into it, coming off this economic period of time where we had amazing, you know, five, six year run here. And, and they're going to come out very weak uh, on the back, back end. So a couple of learning objectives I want to go through here. We're going to look at hyper change and how it impacts planning and decision making. Then we're going to pause and talk about this is a key one, how well your organization is positioned right now, you know, how financially healthy are you or not healthy and how that will impact your decision making. Then we're going to go and we'll see these on the, on the framework template when we get there towards the end. You don't need it now. Uh, we're going to talk about two variability factors. One is the vulnerability of your funding sources. And I think almost all organizations are impacted here, and I'll show you a way to think about that. And then we're going to separately look at demand volatility pressure. There's demands going in both directions. There probably isn't an organization out there that hasn't had to cancel or defer or delay something already, some event or such. And there's organizations that are ex seeing extreme increases in demand, you know, social welfare services, community food banks, and such. And so we can see increasing and decreasing demands. Um, I do want to come back to, I'm going to overly talk about these two positions. Most organizations are in one of the two of these. They're either in a strong position, and we're going to be looking at operating reserves. And we'll be looking at this through the balance sheet. And I'll come back to this. Anybody who's been in my classes before, you know I get hyper view on the balance sheet. The health of an organization only shows up on the balance sheet. And we'll talk about that. But organizations that are in a strong financial position, they have operating reserves, what are their options versus an organizations that are struggling, don't have much cash, cash flow is a problem, accounts payable is a constant management issue, and what are some of the things they're looking at? There are really two different scenarios. And then I wanna finish with how we're going to message this information, how we take our decision making and actually bring a sense of calmness and order to something that's very you know, overwhelming right now. And we're gonna do that through the framework. And um, I love the word framework. I'm gonna talk about that more when we get there and, and what that means and how we can use that spreadsheet and it's there for your use. Um, so um, those, five, those learning objectives are gonna be broken down into five areas here. We're gonna talk about a starting point first. Then we're gonna go through the three critical factors. We're going to talk about timing and implementation. We're going to cycle back through and talk about operating reserves because it's extremely important and how they impact on a strong position versus a weak position. And then I would like to say we'll keep a close eye on the, um, on the time, uh, Deb, so we make sure we have time to go through the framework worksheet. Okay, starting point. So just to restate the position, during extraordinary times of hyper change that we are confronted with now, affecting making effective management decisions is overwhelming and if we can do what i talked about earlier which is say like we're going to give overweight over preference to the financial impact of these decisions it'll actually help us and guide us because there's like it's infinite type um variables that we're dealing with that are changing literally before our eyes i can't tell you how many times factors on the ground have changed on a daily basis. Just talking about the PPP, the payroll protection program and such, um, other organizations. I will tell you, Deb, from the, um, the polling questions, which is very helpful. This, I've done this 
webinar more than two dozen times already. This is the first group where I see most organizations have, don't anticipate having drastic changes to their staffing and budgeting. And that's great. The only other group I did for a whole group of, um, of um, medical clinics that infectious disease and they're doubling and tripling overnight. So um, that's good. A lot of organizations are really struggling, um, had an immediate impact on, and this is really um, this morning at eight o'clock this morning, I was on with um, probably 30 of the top 100 largest nonprofits in the country were on this. They were all large, very, very large CFO based organizations, and they're all dealing with unbelievable changes. Michael? Yes. Yeah. That so many of our members feel reasonably solid financially, but I think it's just worth noting that what you just said is still really important to us because the way our members do their work involves coalitions with all the nonprofits in their states and communities that work on these issues. And our ability to do what we need to do really depends on that full network staying strong too. But the first step is our group staying strong, which is of course why we've got you talking today. It's a really good point, Deb, what you're bringing out, because um, I think some of the dominoes we haven't seen yet, some of them haven't even started to fall over. And, um, you know, no, no nonprofit is so siloed that the economy, those partnerships, um, how we, how, when, and we provide resources, you know, the sheltering in place, how that affects. So with that said, um, as I stated earlier, we're going to look at, you know, we don't, under, we don't know the answer to timing, scope, and impact. So if everybody will please memorize this bottom sentence, we have to adopt a conservative approach right now that favors overweights the impact of management decisions have on protecting our financial resource. So that's step number one, okay? So um, the first polling question, Deb, could you pop that up real quick? I think it's a pretty simple question, but I wanna see if everybody understands that. This is a very important, important point and see how they react to it. Deb, are you okay pulling up? Yeah, there it is. Thank you. So, do you agree with adopting a conservative approach to management decisions by giving extra weight uh, to the financial assets and impact? Uh, yes or no? If you could please take that. Um, anybody who has a, uh, a no to that, or even on a yes, if you would like to make a comment in the chat, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Deb, are you there? Deb, I can't hear you right now. Here we now. go. I am, and we still have people responding. So in just a minute, I will end the polling and share the screen. Okay, perfect. And I, I can see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just waiting to see. No, we still have a couple more trickling in. So. Okay. Um. All right. I'm going to guess most are done, and I will end it, and I will share the results. So, of of all respondents, every single one agrees. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the second part. I am gonna pick up speed here a little bit. Um, this part is, and because we will be seeing this again through the framework, uh, just watching the timing. Yeah, so Michael, part, I'm gonna interrupt quickly. And Jennifer points out that the challenge is uh, messaging that to staff. And Jonathan points out it's hard to do it about spending when it affects payroll. And I think you're gonna, talk about both of those, but I just wanted to flag that to you. Both of those are in the chat. Yes, and if I would add a third layer to that, both of those are one, two, and in no particular order. Number three is messaging to the board, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that. I 100% agree with those comments. Okay, in step two, we're gonna be looking at three separate components. We're gonna take a quick look at assessing financial health, then we're gonna look at the vulnerability of funding sources, and then we're gonna look at how demand pressures are changing. I wanna talk about each one of those. I will let you know that at the, we're saving time for the end of the presentation. You will see these on the spreadsheet when we pull it up, okay? Uh, referencing financial health, I think, is a very important first step. It's not there by accident. It's not there by alphabetical, okay? And I want people to be able to step back and take a quick look at their balance sheet um, 
you know, I'm, I hope I'm not overly biased, Deb, but when I pop open a balance sheet, I do look, I go to operating reserves, but you can fairly quickly look at a 990, look at an audited financial report or, a, or an annual report, and you could see if a financial statement is either strong or weak. And just think about this for a minute. Look up at the ceiling for a second. What an organization is, if, and an organization is blessed with a very strong balance sheet, and they have a year or two's worth of operating reserves built up, and they're not struggling on payroll or accounts payable, and they have, they're debt free and they have operating reserves, that's unrestricted net assets. Um, the options and things an organization like that can do versus an organization that is just constantly balancing 90 days, 100 days of accounts payable. They're going from pay period to pay period, just hoping they have enough cash funds to make the next payroll. Those two organizations are in totally two different places as far as being able to react to a crisis and being able in the options they have on the table to take. Okay, so um, if you could pop open polling question number two, Deb. Yep. Okay, uh, and sure. that will go along with this and whether you agree, basically the polling I'm question. I'm not there yet, give me one sec, sorry. Okay. I'm still sharing the old results, which is not what I wanna do. Um, Okay, now I'm watching it. Yeah, perfect. And it's just restating the balance sheet is the key strengths and weaknesses. I think it's extremely important and we need to be transparent with our boards on this. While you're answering that question, I think most nonprofit organizations do not do enough, uh, spend enough time sharing their balance sheet with their staff. And at the C-suite level, they do look at it, but I think they, they're like children, they have, um, you know, um, selective seeing or selective hearing on it. And then of course, in a priority at board meetings. So how did that come out, Deb? Uh, I'm still giving people a moment. Um, although actually we may have, no, we still have a couple more people responding. Let me just give it a moment more. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and um, set that down when you can, just keeping an eye on the time. Yeah. Okay, we've got 38 responses, so I'm going to decide that that is enough. And the results here are um, overwhelming agreement, but with 37 or 95 percent, but two said no. And the two of you that said no, if you could put a chat comment with other key metrics in, um, I will share that with Michael at a later point, and I will stop and sharing. I and we can learn from everybody else. And every time you think you've seen a situation, a situation will pop up. But good. So um, really important first step. It doesn't take very long to do that. You'll see on the spreadsheet, I'm gonna give you a couple ways to do that. That's a more powerful way to show your staff and the board. Okay. So it gives us um, this um, a, an opportunity to look at our operating reserves. Um, I call it formal versus informal. And the formal means that uh, organizations that have an established operating reserve policy, a formal operating reserve policy that's been adopted by the board, you have your benchmark, you have your goal in there. Organizations that don't, and I know there's quite a few organizations that don't have one. What I mean by informal is you should, op you should pretend like you have one and adopt a, um, and I'll talk more about this later on, adopt a, um, you know, a sort of a, a, a temporary goal of what your operating reserve should be so you can you know, talk with the board about that as a benchmark. And we'll see that in a, um, in a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, um, so let's go to step two. This is really my, um, I hate to say the word favorite, my one I rely on the most when I'm looking at organizations after doing the, um, the look at um, how strong or weak we are. And in this step, we're looking at, at the quality of our funding sources. And before I go to the next page, what we don't wanna do, and a lot of groups are doing this, or especially early on, was sitting there and saying, oh my God, you know, we know our funding is going to be impacted. We hope it's only going to be down 20%. We think it might be down 25%. And it doesn't, to me, it sounds like a total guess because you're taking all the funds for the organization and bleeding it down to 1%. And what I'd like to do, as you'll see on this slide 17 here, is break it down into three areas. And all of a sudden, it becomes a very thoughtful process. And I think the board will take comfort in the way that the C-suite, the staff, senior management have looked at their funding sources. And I do these three buckets. I slightly change these for different organizations. I've been helping doing this. And sometimes we even change the titles. So you don't have to stay with rock solid, vulnerable, and shaky. 
It depends on the organization. I was doing an engineering society. They didn't like the word shaky, so we replaced that with a more volatile, or you know, I think is the word we put in there. But And you'll see the percentages could change among different organizations. But I really like this for a general starting point, a theme. Um, the rock solid would be uh, funding sources that are won't change or only change slightly vulnerable or change uh, uh, significantly and shaky or there's some of the ones that could actually disappear. Uh, you could have a type of funding source that could end up in all three buckets. If you're an organization that relies heavily on grants, you could have rock solid grants that are coming from a federal agency that are committed. And I even have some groups that are those, those rock solid grants are actually increasing. Uh, you, could have, um, you could have grants that are in a vulnerable spot uh, they might be coming from another nonprofit organization. Right now, they said we're committed to you, but you don't know how this is going to affect them. And you could have um, some shaky grants. They could be coming from private foundations and things that are really been hit in the stock market, and they they're cutting way back or turning off the grants temporarily, and such. Um, membership organization. <clears throat> if you compare the two years between um, a 9/11 and the current uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, just from a timing point of view, 9-11 happened in September. The current COVID-19 crisis uh, started in March, beginning of March. They're exactly six months apart. So an organization that has an annual dues renewing cycle that um, begins <clears throat> on June 30th is affected this time much different than they were affected with the September one. The June 30s back on 9-11, <clears throat> most of their memberships are already all in the door. They were well positioned and, um, and such. Those same groups right now, they are, you know, this all started hitting the middle of March. Most of those groups will be dropping their dues notices between April 1st and April 15th, right around now. <clears throat> and in probably couldn't be a more uncertain time to do that. And we're going through all different strategies, how they should do that and such. So there's a lot of things that can be working for you and against you. And as all these different upturns and downturns happen, you got to be aware of your cycles and such. But go back to this, Deb. I would like to um, pause here for a second and say I really like dividing this into three categories. I think two categories is not enough, and I would highly not recommend going into more than three categories. I sort of like this. So with that, could you launch a polling question number three? Uh, that goes with the side, slide, please. Okay, you should be able to see it. Good. And so this is asking you, do you like the three, um, do you agree with this um, type? And if, if not here, we start to see a little more disagreements. I'd love to see any other strategies that might come into play and some things that you've already been able to put, um, to think about. And Michael, while they're answering, uh, the, the question that came to my mind is, why would you not have a category that just says lost, the absolutely known lost funding? Yeah, um, you could. And again, the style for each one, uh, to me, that would go on, this, on the shaky because that's zero to 100%. Okay. So right. you would put it down there. Um, and you could have a fourth category. And again, I'm a firm believer because this, this, we're gearing towards a dashboard that that dashboard needs to work for your organization, you know? And small changes can help in the absorbability, how people look at it, okay? So a change like that would be purposeful. You know, we would talk about it and could show up on the spreadsheet. Right. I, I just think sometimes showing boards and staff how much money was actually lost has an impact that is different in putting it into the zero to whatever. So that's just- yeah, And we'll, um, that's a good point. And we'll see that in the next category where we're gonna turn this into dollars. Okay. But right now, I like to message, I often like to message financial terms and non-dollars. So I like to say, instead of saying we lost $300,000 worth of grants, I'd rather say we lost 22% of this type of funding. It just helps people to get around. So it looks like we have uh, everybody liking this strategy. Good. And you'll see this. If you could go ahead and close that, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see the strategy show up. So let's go to the third part. And Deb, you are really insightful because your comment will show up in here. And here, we, um, and we'll see this on the spreadsheet, we come back and I do heavily, my thinking here is heavily towards presenting this to the board and to outsiders what our plan is. And I like to look at the top, at the top of the spreadsheet. Um, what are our five um, 
in order of magnitude are largest are events that it could be or not be affected by COVID-19. Because I have put in Deb like groups that thought um, their membership would be affected and people are renewing or something. So it's the top five programs, events, activities uh, specific to your organization and how you feel um, um, and, and a comment there about how they will be affected by um, this hyper change period. Um, part two to this, Deb, and everybody on the line, I, um, I use this about half of the time, this controllable, uncontrollable list. Um, and what I, I've gotten um, more than a few nods of board members saying they like this, because what it lets the board know is the staff is dealing with some changes they control and some changes they don't control. So for example, you know, we had a, a major event you know, a, uh, a gala, a major event scheduled for April 10th, you know, that had, you know, we didn't choose to turn that off. It, you know, we had to turn that off. Um, and, you know, I won't go through all the examples. This morning, because we had our, all supersized organizations on, um, and, and it was really interesting to listen to the stories of the events that were scheduled around March 15th to March 20th. Um, because before March, March 15, um, states were starting to pull back, airlines were starting to cancel flights. But as they contacted the hotels and convention centers and things, they were still open. And they were worried about with insurance and things. And they were saying at that time that it was already in the uncontrollable, that they couldn't get speakers there. You know, attendees weren't able to come and such. But by March 20th, it became totally uncontrollable because you know we couldn't have groups meeting in most jurisdictions or more than 10 employees. What I really like, that way we don't get the board wasting time talking about the things that you had to automatically shut off. We really want them to concentrate on that controllable box. And these are the programs that are scheduled for June, July, August. Can we pivot to an online program? Do we want to delay, shift it to when people can start coming back and all those things. And that's where we start to, you know, get creative in our process and such. Um, I'll leave it up to you uh, whether you think having that controllable, uncontrollable is a good thing. Um, you'll see it on the spreadsheet. I think it'll mean even more to you when we get there. Okay, so let's go to the third um, piece of this, which is timing and implementation. So um, here is another new concept. And I made this up and don't make fun of my um, titling, but I call it super short term and short term. Usually it's just short term, midterm and long term. And I'm added this super short term and I am hyper focused on super short term. And I think it gives a sense of calmness that we can focus people on the thing. These are focusing us on the decisions we need to make immediately keeping an eye on decisions that are sitting right behind them and, and being able to react because there's some things we don't know how they're going to play out in this um, hyper change period. So super short term versus short term. Um, you'll see this again, this needs to be common size to your organization. My generic starting point is to consider super short term as the decisions that we're making now over the next four weeks, one month, I will tell you that as your organization gets larger, those shift periods get shorter. So when I'm working with a mega sized nonprofit, we're usually going up to zero to 10 days. And our short term is going out 10 days to about 30, maybe up to 60 days. It's just because of the magnitude of the changes in the dollars and the, um, and the, you know, the planning and we can't be as nimble the bigger you are. So, um, so can you, I'm just going to pause here. I'm going to repeat myself. I find this very, very important to break down act, the decisions we're making into this super short term and short term. Again, we'll come, we'll see this on the framework. It's section three on the framework. Um, and you'll see how we handle this really important piece. Okay. I think doing this adds another sense because it's just overwhelming how many decisions and, and if you just sit back and think, like even organizations like it seems here, Deb, we have a lot of organizations that seem to be well positioned um, and such because of all the partnerships and other things that are going on around us, um, there is still a lot that we can't anticipate. So taking the super short term or short term adds a sense of purpose. It helps us to focus on the immediate steps, which gives a sense of calmness that we, we got a plan in place. We're going to do this. 
and um, but we're still going to read and react to the changing situations around us. Okay, uh, so let's go to um, uh, part four, which is I want to talk a little bit about operating reserves and being financially strong versus financially weak. Um, we will see. Can yes. I jump in here a moment? We sure. have a question in the Q and A that says, "Can you define operating reserves?" So you might want an operating reserve policy. So you might want to just touch on that before you go into the body of this discussion. Sure. And let's do that right here. It's very appropriate and really a good question. You know, um, so let's go through a basic definition of operating reserves. Operating reserves come out of starting point as unrestricted or without donor restricted net assets. And they have to be the liquid portion of those. Um, and so let's view a balance sheet that has assets at the top liabilities in the middle and net assets on the bottom. Okay, so uh, an organization that's built up operating reserves from surpluses from mostly from exchange transactions and donor transactions that have come in that are unrestricted. Okay, um, so those funds would be liquid assets. Um, we usually a uh, formal operating reserve policy is broken into four components. It's stating our operating reserve goal in terms of mission and programs. So that would be if we're a uh, community food bank, it, our operating reserve goal would be to have, um, you know, a hundred, be able to um, have enough reserves to keep the food bank open for a hundred operating days that would serve, you know, 50 families a day. Okay. Part two of that operating reserve policy would take that formula, convert it to a dollar amount. Okay, so what we say to people is, you know, our operating reserve goal is to have 100 uh, days um, of, of resources ready to go. And we're actually sitting at 75, which is not bad, but we're not quite at our goal. Uh, we convert that to a dollar amount. Um, that dollar amount might be $2 million. And on an $8 million budget, that would equal, you know, 25% of the budget. Okay. So now we have the first two steps, operating reserve goal and purpose, operating reserve goal and dollars. Uh, the third step is to find how an organization will um, use their operating reserves. Um, and all, all um, organizations are at one of three spots when it comes to operating reserves. They're either below the reserve goal, at the reserve goal, or near it, or above the reserve goal. And then we have definitions for how we can use reserves of those and how we budget for contribution to reserves, which would be your surplus in your budget. And then the, the fourth step in an operating reserve policy would be a, a monitoring tool to show that we will report to the, to the board annually where our operating reserves are and how our next budget year would impact them. So in repeating the operating reserves, you know, an organization's got six months operating reserves versus an organization that is underwater, has negative operating reserves, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They're in two different places. One more thing I think everybody should write down is there is no perfect operating reserve goal, but out of the NORI, the National Operating Reserve Initiative, which was a collaborative between the Urban Institute and United Way International, and lots of people who, who sat on those committees, and I, was, I worked on that, we only could come to one agreement, and the agreement was that organizations that built up, and write this down, that have less than three months, less than three months of operating reserves are considered to be in a weakened position. And the way I like to flip that around is, is that you want to be at least at three months and, and gunning for more uh, to be in what we would call a position of strength. Um, Deb, I think most 501s are going to get this question anyway. Most 501c3 organizations, publicly supported groups, are in that three to six month range. Um, you pivot over to membership, um, trade, professional organizations, they might be in that six to 12 months, but it's all over the place. But organizations that are struggling to build operating reserves, we build the first operating reserve policy to try to get to the three month mark, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. So you can see how operating reserves are really a, a good definition and a benchmark to use. Uh, there's so many other things we can look at on a balance sheet, you know, cash position, uh, accounts payable, cash flow and such. But this brings us back to the statement that organizations have substantial operating reserves, have a whole different set of options and tactics to consider, 
let organizations that are underwater with little to no operating reserves. Now, let me answer the question of what underwater means. And that is an undefined term, but let me tell you the way I look at it. If you view your balance sheet, you might have millions of dollars on your balance sheet and you could be underwater. And a couple of ways to look at that. If you have $2 million in net assets and, and you're sitting on $2.5 million of restricted net assets, that means you most likely have a negative $500,000 of unrestricted net assets. So you bled into your restricted net assets. That's one way to be underwater. Another way to be underwater is an organization that has a lot of unrestricted net assets, $2 million unrestricted net assets, but they also own their own building. And that building is on the books net, you know, of, you know, net of depreciation and loans and all that is on the building at $3 million. They, they're probably struggling day to day on cash because even though the building the, is an unrestricted net asset, it's not liquid. So their operating reserves are unrestricted net assets and the liquid portion of those cash, accounts receivable, you know, prepaid expenses minus accounts payable. Yes. I have two questions I'm gonna include here. One is somebody just asked if there's attachments you're referring to and the temp you're talking about the template will go through at the end, right? Not another yeah, attachment. We're gonna, we're gonna pivot there in a couple of minutes because um, okay. we're running out of time here, yeah. And the other question is, do you include unrestricted endowment and operating reserves even if equities had to be sold as a loss? Um, that's a tricky question, but just remember, if you put the words unrestricted and endowment, that most likely that endowment came from a board designation. And board designations are unrestricted because what a board designates one year, a future board can undesignate. And GAP generally accepted accounting principles through that. A permanently restricted endowment that's driven by a donor, a funding source, you know, we can't repurpose um, without the donors. So, but that's a whole separate word. A lot of organizations have, and write that down, have designated unrestricted net assets, and they're going to be looking at maybe, you know, removing some of those designations. Okay. Um, one more quick thing, because I want to save some time to go through the spreadsheet. Um, the financial strength and weaknesses is um, really two different points of view. Uh, organizations with operating reserves, they have very, um, you know, they have long-term investments, they built up assets, okay? They have a whole different set of decisions that they can make, um, which is good because weak organizations don't have any of those options. The bad part of those strong organizations is, is we're going to look back and see, did they use those operating reserves in a manner that kept the organization strong? And because we don't know how deep, how long, how, um, what the scope is of this hyper change period, the guess is, you know, should we be using operating reserves now and how much? And, I'll, and this concept of metering out, uh, Deb, is I wrote um, an article that I just uh, posted up on the website. Uh, this morning on this. It's a project I'm working with George Channel. It's a really good one about using operating reserves. And um, there'll be future webinars on that because that's a, you know, something we'll talk about, but how to use those. I do just want to pivot to the bottom. That organization without operating reserves, notice there's only one bullet point. They got to look at cost containment quickly. They got to assess what funding methods, funding sources are, are at risk. And they don't have anything. They don't have a savings account to fall back on. And so they got to downsize quickly. 9-11 caught a lot of groups like this because it happened in September. All the donor-based groups that collect money in the last quarter of the fiscal year, um, you know, a lot of those funds got redirected. Uh, they were well into their year and um, could not recover. So it was really a tough situation. So this is talking about financial strength or weakness, and we'll see this on the spreadsheet in a few minutes. So organizations with operating loans, good position, but it's difficult. And we won't know until two years from now, did we make good decisions how to use those? Looking back to 9-11 and the 2008-9 banking crisis, uniformly, I think a lot of organizations had reserves burned through more than they should have in the early stages of that, okay? And then we'll talk about this a little bit more. The article I just released this morning is all on this one page right here. Okay, financially weak organizations, they've got to move quickly to cost containment. They don't have to worry about burning through assets that they don't have. But if they, you know, continue, you know, um, some of these organizations, unfortunately, I hate to say it, 
but payroll makes up a huge chunk of the budget. You take away payroll, you take away occupancy and all that, there's not much discretionary spending there. They don't pull back and downsize quickly. Uh, those payroll costs build up really fast and they get to the point where they, you know, they go over the edge and they can't make payroll and they're in a really tough situation. Okay, so those are the four critical areas. We're gonna go through the, um, walk through the framework now. Uh, we're gonna talk about, as we walk through the framework, we're gonna talk about step one, uh, the financial health. And then we're gonna go to step two to look at operating reserves and step three are the super short short, the financial driven um, actions. And you'll see these three steps clearly on the framework um, as we go through. Uh, this is a recap. Step one has assessing the balance sheet, vulnerability, and then step three is demand, volatility, pressure. Uh, we'll look at this assessment in the middle of the framework, a weak, neutral, strong position. And, um, and then on the bottom of the framework, we're gonna talk about super short-term actions versus short-term actions. So with that, I'm gonna pivot to the framework. Uh, I just wanna make sure that it shows up on the screen. So Deb, can you see this? Right now, I'm seeing your PowerPoint with you know, okay. the rest okay. of the slides. Okay, let me go ahead and do it this way. Um, and um, you should now be able to see the framework. Can you see it? Yes, and I'm also sending around the website again that people can pull it from. Okay. So we're good. We have about 10 minutes left. I would like to spend a good five minutes or so going through this and then we can do some questions. My favorite word on this framework, and you'll see my cursor, is the word framework. A framework is, gives a sense that it's a well thought out process that we've gone through, but no framework is permanent. It's what works at the moment and we will go through a reassessment later on. I wanna show you that the top of the worksheet has step one. You see that up here, financial health assessment. It's made in the three parts. We'll come back to that in a minute. Step two is in the middle, operating reserve policy position, weak, neutral, strong. And then step three is the super short, short term, the steps we're gonna take. And I'm gonna talk about each of these. The top is, is really where the work is. And here we're getting a visual presentation. This is a form of a dashboard to take something that's super complicated and to try to get it onto one sheet of paper that we can put in front of a board. Column one here is our balance sheet, making a quick assessment. You can list your strengths up here, your weaknesses here, and then I like to have a comment about operating reserves here. I do erase this line right here, available for use. Most organizations, it's too a little early on that. I'll talk about it, I talk about it in the article. So uh, organizations financially strong would show a lot of cash. They would show long-term investments. Uh, they would show um, some, maybe some fixed assets and things. They would show, for weaknesses, they would show very little accounts payable, which is actually a strength. Um, and their only weakness really might be that they, some of the long-term investments are in the market and the market is, you know, is getting taken a pretty good 20, 25% hit. So that's a weakness. And so those strong organizations, they might have a reserve goal of 12 months. They're sitting on 30 months of reserves, and I usually blank this out. So the board can say 12 months is our goal, we got 30 months, we're way above our goal. Okay, a weak organization would look differently. Their strengths might have very few things to list up here, and then all of a sudden they have a lot of weaknesses. Low cash balance, high accounts payable, debt, a lot of, un a lot of restricted funds. And down here, their operating reserve goal might be six months or three months, and their actual might be negative two or three months. They might be actually underwater, okay? So you can tell if you're in a strong or weak position. We will use this in box two down here to check one of these three boxes, weak, strong, and neutral. Come back to that in a minute. The middle bucket, my favorite bucket here, is to do this assessment. And this is really not in dollars, it's in percent. So you're letting both yourself, your staff, and the board know that we've taken all our funding sources and they should fit in one of these three categories. You can right size this to your organization. These are sort of generic. You can also change the terminology here. Some people take offense at the word shaky, whatever you wanna use. This is my starting point. I like rock solid. 
vulnerable, shaky. And understand that you can break a funding source into three areas. For example, grants could be list a certain grants here, another type of grants here, another type down here. Okay, and these are the percentages. Um, so I got this the other day. You could have a source up here that's actually increasing. Don't have to just list the decreasing. There's been a few organizations I've been working with that are eligible for increased funding during this time. So you could have that. And then the demand volatility shows up in the last box here. Here I have room for five of the key things and events that are being impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. And you would expand on how they're being impacted. And here, and this box down here is the controllable, uncontrollable, and here is where we put the dollar increases and decreases. I like doing it this way and not redoing the whole budget and just say, look, from the uncontrollable ones, this, has got, this is where we took a hit. And the controllable ones, this is what we're doing, but we think the revenue is going to be down, okay? And you can come up with a couple of totals here so we can sort of see what we're trying to deal with, what we might have to common size our expense budget around. Then we go into the middle bucket from here will be you know, either most groups are just here or here. Sometimes I get rid of this middle bucket. I don't I just put it in neutral. Uh, three months, six months, over six months. Um, a lot of groups that would be three months and their goal might be 12 months. Okay, so there's different ways, but this is sort of a, a semi generic um, benchmark to start with. Uh, if you have an operating reserve policy, a formal one in place, you will use this. If you don't, you will temporarily adopt what I call a formal policy and figure out what your goal would be if you were putting one in place and you'd probably be starting with the three month mark unless you already have substantial reserves and then you'd be in the six to 12 month. And then if you go to the bottom of the worksheet, and I usually have six, seven or eight lines down here. I just have four on this template. Um, Based on the above, we're gonna take action A, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, five. And of those actions, some of them are gonna be in our super short term and some are in short term. The reason that you could have an action here and still check short term is sometimes I call it hot buttons, board member, like a membership organization. All they wanna talk about is membership, membership, membership. And so on the top line, membership, is okay for right now, and we're not gonna do any short-term changes, super short-term changes. So we might have a check here on how membership might be impacted. And then we have other things, um, you know, events. We're going online, we have to pivot quickly, um, certain things. We're going to downsize staff, we're going to um, uh, delay a program, we're gonna contact our sponsors. Uh, what are we going to do um, about all the sponsorships we received in for the events that are being delayed or canceled? Okay, so um, Deb, I show us only having a few minutes left. I do want to make one more statement. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint slide for a second. Okay. Uh, and I do that, we have one technical question. We've actually been so thorough, we have only one question at the moment, and that technical question is, do encumbrances count as accounts receivable for the purposes of this worksheet? Um, you got to go very quickly into cash flow issues. Um, so something that's encumbered is really committed to, we have to have the funds set aside so they wouldn't be sitting in um, operating reserve or unrestricted. Oh, she that. says, I'm sorry, payable, accounts payable. Accounts payable definitely come into play. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fact, yeah. So I'm going to make this one statement, Deb, and then we're going to throw it open to the floor. Mm -hmm. that you see the framework. I know we went through it a little bit quick, but this assessment will give the board of directors confidence that the senior management team has taken a thoughtful and objective approach to quantify near-term decision-making with a conservative bias of protecting the organization's financial position during this hyper-change period where we just don't know. Once we start to see where true recovery or recovery starts to happen and we can start to model out we'll be in a totally different situation than we are now. So I just think overweighting towards the financial picture and that's what the framework does and we can update that once a month. So I'll throw it back to you, um, Deb. So we will take questions in the Q and A. Um, we did take a few there already and answered them. Um, you're welcome to also put comments in the chat. And while we're waiting for them, I do wanna say that 
I think this approach also is probably really worth sharing with staff. But Michael, I would love you to comment on that. I think this is a scary and difficult time for staff. And I think staff often don't understand what the executive director and the senior team are trying to juggle and balance. And so I'd love you to comment on that. And while you're getting ready to comment, Yes, we are gonna send the recording and the slide deck to everybody who registered, which includes obviously participants um, after the webinar. But do you wanna comment on using this with the staff as well as the board? Yes, um, it's really a good comment in putting both the staff and the board into this bucket. Senior management's gonna be making very quick decisions. And I think what, the way we counterbalance that to get people to feel calm and confident, and we have to always keep confidence and trust high, is we have to over-message, over-communicate during this time. We don't have time to bring 100 people into the room and ask, do you agree or disagree with these things? We're literally making changes on the fly. If you don't communicate, you know, people fall back into the conspiracy theory because they just don't know what's going on. And the framework is one method of reaching out to both sets to say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. You could see what we use as a basis for our decisions and that we've been thoughtful and we've had a, an objective approach, okay? So I agree. I just think I want you to over communicate for the foreseeable future. And then we can go back to norms, you know, to keep the board informed, keep staff informed as things are playing out. Let them know that where you're struggling to make decisions and what decisions you've made. Uh, don't keep them in the dark. Uh, be overly transparent. I've always said my whole career, high performing organizations embrace transparency. Okay, and that's, that's what we should be. We should be putting our, our decisions out there, but also I think it helps us to come, knowing that they're out there, it helps us to come to better decisions. So I'm just gonna add that this is, an even more difficult time in terms of stress and fear for staff um, than a normal economic crisis because they're also afraid for their lives. I mean, I just think we have to be as clear as that. And the more you communicate with staff and the more they understand that even if they don't necessarily agree with your decisions, that you're really being thoughtful about it, I think the calmer they will be. Um, we have a, quest a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one I will ask you to answer specifically for this person later, but in general, one of our audience members wonders if you would do this webinar for all the nonprofits in Alaska. Are you open to doing requests for statewide networks of nonprofits? And I'll send you Trevor's particular contact later. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot of regional ones, just did for the state of Florida, um, northern part of Florida. Yeah, the, whatever. This. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, at this, you know, fin finances, you know, I always say there's red and blue issues. Well, we're today talking about green, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And I believe that the biggest risk, you know, an ERM, an enterprise risk management issue, this is it. It's around where organizations can get sideways really fast, where they could make a critical mistake. It's not protecting the financial position. You could almost you know, do something that someone might sue you on and all that it won't matter if you, you know, if you run out of financial resources and have to close the doors or be substantially different. That's the biggest risk. So this is a uniform topic for all nonprofits. C6, C3s, you know, public-private partnerships, everything. Does it make sense, Michael, for people to email me if they want to host it for their statewide nonprofits and maybe to conserve your time, we can do several states at once? Um, oh, I would uh, appreciate that. Like I'm losing my voice. I'm doing this. This is my third one today. Um, yes. It's so important, but I think it's because um, it's really helped a lot of organizations. I will tell you, I keep blanks of that worksheet <laughs> right. sitting at next to my desk because when people call and I go, oh, who are you? Explain what you are about. I'm using it. You know, we're okay. using it. Right. Hey, Even everybody Email me if you want it for your state network and we'll try and group these in some reasonable numbers so that Michael can do it in a more manageable way. We have two other questions and I'm gonna keep us just a little longer if you can, Michael, to answer them. The more technical one is when you define monthly operating expenses, how do you address annual expenses such as insurance in the audit? Do you average them monthly or how do you do it? 
Uh, yes, the, I, it's a really good question. I take the annual budget, I divide it by 12. I'm more worried about not what I would call, those are operational core, um, what we would, uh, does, um, audits, insurance, occupancy, to cost that are one time. Uh, we do want a one twelfth those. I will be talking in other presentations down the road about 90 day cash flow budgets. What you do need to take out are your event based um, activities because those programs could be being turned off. So, you know, um, so I'm more looking at taking out the variable costs related to events that we, um, if we turn off an event, we also don't incur those costs related to, you know, hotel, convention center, conference, catering, you know, those type of resources. Okay. And, and Melody, we will be doing follow-up work, and so we'll make sure we go into this in more depth. The broader question, and I think I have an actual answer that I will tentatively offer, but I'd like your take on it first, is how do you have a conversation about scarcity with staff if the staff truly honestly believes that the scarcity mentality is a myth and this is a problem of fundraising, not budgeting? Well, I mean, First of all, we will be guessing. I, I go back to the framework. I go back to the three buckets and figure out what sources of funds are at risk and when they're at risk, okay? And I believe we are out there uh, with staff um, on the front end. The information will get out eventually. The earlier it's out, the better. I mean, we have organizations like, go back to the membership organizations that just renewed their memberships. They're in great shape right now. But they're going to come up on a renewal cycle in six months or something, and we're not sure how that's going to impact. And um, we don't want to, you know, scare anybody. But I don't equate scaring someone with truthfulness, you know. And if your members are impacted um, and they're not going to be able to, re, you know, or your donors, you know, where you know we won't be um, looking at organizations that get a lot of fundraising dollars in the you know, fourth quarter calendar year you know i can't tell you you know where contributions will be in november and december but i have to feel like they will be different i think medically we will eventually get COVID 19 under control financially i think the impact from this thing is going to be felt for a long time just like out of the last couple of crises um and so um you know, these decisions will be down there. That's why I like to super short and short. And the conversations be for right now, we're keeping full staffing with this, but we all want you to know that we're, it's fluid. And our major, major revenue cycles are later in the year, thank God. But we're, we're, we're assessing that, but we don't have to assess that today. We're, we're looking at it. We're doing what we can to shore them up. And, um, and if you don't, they're going to think about it anyway. So I'd rather be out front. I, I don't believe in that, you know, it's bad information scares people. I believe it's current and accurate and timely and truthful and you get it out there. I, I think that's right. I, I will add that I think uh, to some extent, this may be because staff live in a silo and are not seeing what's happening with fundraising and partner organizations. And maybe that'll trickle through, but it may be helpful to um, find people they trust in other parts of the sector who are also struggling with fundraising and, and to understand there's been a real shift in the fundraising environment. Um, you know, it's, that's Jennifer, something that you and I can talk about a little more offline if that's helpful. Michael, thank you so much for doing this webinar today. I think you can tell from the questions that people found it really helpful. I think our next step is going to be me talking with you to talk about what the next step options are, and then I'll pull together a survey monkey to see which ones would be most helpful for people, and then we will move forward with that. But I think this was a really great starting point, and I think that framework is exactly what people needed right now. Um, thank you so much. Um, Good. If you could let people know that, you know, on the website, um, they can get to find the framework and um, they also can see the article that was originally posted around this. And then there, um, the last operating reserve article is just posted and there's ones in between on and we'll be posting more information each week. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording and end the webinar, everybody. I hope you have a, a great rest of the day and that this webinar helps you